All right. Up next, we have Kent Nurbergal talking about reverse engineering SpaceX Accelerate like Elon. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, James. Shh. <laughs> uh, just a quick note, I do not work for SpaceX, so there's no like inside information here or anything. I've just been examining it from the outside. Uh, I wouldn't mind working for SpaceX, but you know, that's, that's life. Um, so one thing that happens a lot with our studies of things is that we assume that these curves will go on forever, these exponential curves, like you know, the idea of the singularity is near or whatever. And they kind of had a similar idea about space in the period, the 66 years between Kitty Hawk and Apollo 11. However, it's been almost as long since then and we've not been back to the moon and so forth. So what tends to happen is what's called the S-curve of technology or uh, the diffusion of innovations curve where things tend to peter off. And what SpaceX has done and what other companies have done when things stagnate is that they tend to, there's a new emerging technology that then tends to break that ceiling and get through it. Um, Speaking of methodologies, if, you're, if any of you are in the computer field, you know the, the idea of there's what was called waterfall methodologies, which were you do all the design first and then you do all the construction and all the testing and all that is iterated like that in big chunks. And that was fine for you know, World War II and so forth, but in the age of the internet where things are moving very, very quickly and we had Moore's Law where the computing power was doubling every, every two years, that was simply not adequate, so we had what's called uh, agile methodologies or scrum or so forth, where things are done in a very short iteration of typically two weeks uh, to a month per cycle. Um, so you have continuous improvement and so forth. And that's how, you, like for example, when you go to Tesla, they don't have model years. They have very slight incremental changes all the time on the assembly line. So a car that you get at the beginning of the model year and the end of the model year is not quite the same car. It's a slightly improved version of the car. So when this top chart, it's, I know it's impossible to read, but this is the limitation of my software. Uh, that's Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Skylab, Space Shuttle, and ISS. That red bar in the middle are all the, is the, basically the age of the waterfall diagram uh, methodology. The agile methodologies came along in the internet era toward the end there, those bottom two. All the blue lines are every project that Elon Musk has been involved in. So uh, Zip2, PayPal, all that. Te SpaceX is the one with the white box around it so you can see it, Tesla, and so forth. So his entire history is in the Agile era. NASA's entire history is in the Waterfall era. So something that Elon Musk himself refers to occasionally as engineering from first principles. He wants to know everything down to the physics of exactly why something is possible or impossible. Um, part of the reason he started the company in the first place was that he was thinking in terms of, well, a rocket has this much aluminum and this much titanium and this much fuel. Those things cost this much on the open market. The value add is incredible. Why is it not cheaper and to, to build these things? Whereas like if you buy wood furniture that's hard wood, there's almost no incremental cost between the cost of just buying the lumber and the furniture. There's nothing to be gained there unless you're a highly skilled craftsman. So that struck him as an opportunity with potential. The second thing is, what does the perfect product look like? He tends to think of the idea of the platonic ideal from uh, Plato's philosophy from over 2,000 years ago. What is the perfect, you know, in Plato's case, it was what's the perfect sphere, the perfect triangle, and so forth, the mathematical perfection of it, of which all things on Earth are shadows of those things. In his case, it's what's the perfect car look like, and all other cars are imperfect copies of that ideal. So, you know, what is the perfect spaceship? What is all that? But you can't start with perfection. You have to start with reality. So in Silicon Valley terms, it's called the minimum viable product or MVP. So what's the minimum you can get to build towards that ideal that would actually have value and sell and so forth? And then you iterate towards that using those agile methodologies until you get closer to the ideal. So you don't get the stagnation of cars looking almost exactly like they did the previous model year or several years in a row, or spacecraft that have no greater capability now than they did 10 years from ago, you have 
a very high speed methodology that's built around moving as close to that perfection as possible over a constant rate instead of moving in fits and spurts. Um, and then the last thing is be prepared to throw the old stuff out if it's completely obsolete and you've got a new technology. So with SpaceX, that's going to be abandoning the Falcon series and moving on to uh, the BFS. In the case of another good example of that is when Apple abandoned the Apple IIe and so forth and went to the Macintosh. There was simply no justification for buying an Apple II when the Macintosh was out. It was just completely obsolete and much for the same reason. Um, another methodology is the idea of a skunk works. This was the term used for the highly classified laboratory that Lockheed had when they built the SR-71. Um, if you know anything about the SR-71, it was an aircraft that pretty much was engineered to perfection and was built over 50 years ago and went Mach 3. There's been nothing like it before, certainly nothing like it since. Um, now, how did they do that? Part of one that they did is they kept all the engineering and all the assembly in the same building. Um, one, so the engineers have to walk through the factory floor and see what's going on in reality with bending metal and fitting parts together and so forth before they even get to their office. SpaceX has a big uh, la engineering office in the middle of the factory floor and so does Tesla. Uh, so you, by putting those functions together, you are anchoring your ideals of what looks good on paper with what's going on in the real world in terms of uh, having a faster acceleration on that. Um, they get a small group of the best talent. Part of the reason, um, if you want to do something really innovative in engineering, you go to SpaceX or Tesla or whatever. You don't go necessarily to uh, Lockheed or whatever. Uh, this gets down to what's called Price's Law, which is the idea that 50% of the work is done by the square root of the team size. This was originally discovered with, th this is, this is actually one of those scary things that's true. It, the bigger the organization, the more bureaucratic it gets. Um, and a smaller and smaller percentage of people is doing a greater and greater percentage of the work. The guy who discovered this was uh, looking at the number of people in academia putting out PhD theses uh, and papers and so forth versus the whole. And then he found this pattern continued not only in human circles, but even in nature. There, was, there were examples of this. Well, when you select for people who work 80 hour weeks and so forth and they you know, are young and energetic and so forth, you're getting as close to that square as possible uh, because it's very hard to survive in an environment like SpaceX or Tesla if you're not in that square. Um, and they also brought a lot of their production in house. So again, you're closing that loop of iterations between I want something, it's there. Um, actually, my dad's old boss 50, 60, 60 years ago made a similar comment when he was doing heavy equipment manufacturing. R.G. Letourneau said, if I have an idea for a hook that can hold 10 tons of weight in the morning, I want to see it hanging a weight by that afternoon because he had all the production stuff in house. He could just build it and see if it worked or not. Similarly, SpaceX built an entire, they built the best uh, thermal protection system, like for re-entry vehicles and so forth, lab in the world in nine months, starting with an empty shell of a room. Um, in fighter pilot circles, they, a guy named John Boyd came up with what was called the OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, act. And the faster a fighter pilot could go through this loop of iterations, the more likely they were to win uh, a competition in, in the air between them and an opponent. Uh, this has been applied to other circles. Well, part of the, the other reason you have engineers working 80 hour weeks is they don't have to iterate between themselves and another engineer to get that 80 hours. It's one guy doing everything in his own head. So he has a very fast reaction loop. He doesn't have to go to a meeting and have feedback and have that information be po potentially misinterpreted by the person at the meeting and then possibly misinterpret the results and file reports and all that sort of thing. At least within his head, He's doing an OODA loop. He is not doing a managerial circle like this. Now, they do have meetings, of course. They do have, but those meetings are on a, on a much more accelerated pace than those in other companies, which brings me to this. There's a wonderful series of YouTube videos by this guy named Dan Rasky at the bottom. He's a NASA engineer who went to work for SpaceX. And he also did some stuff with uh, 
uh, Blue Origin, um, basically as a NASA representative in those circumstances. And what, going back to that uh, thermal protection lab, they would get something to where it was about 51% likely to succeed in a test, and then they'd just test it, and they would set, test the smallest sample they could that would give them valid results. So by doing this much more quickly than NASA, who would need like an 80, 90% uh, chance of success before they would you know, break up the meeting and actually go and see what the data was, uh, they, would, they were creating a much richer data set getting from point A to point B. So if you graph that out just generically, if you're doing this many hours per iteration, you know, NASA, it's more hours per iteration, SpaceX less hours, and then that yellow line is the gap. Um, and your cost iteration is you're doing kind of an 80-20 rule. If you get 80% of work done and 20% of the time, and as the old joke goes, the last 20% takes the other 80% of your schedule, um, you have this escape velocity essentially of, the more times you do this, the further ahead you pull on a smaller and smaller budget than your competitors. Uh, modularity, you probably all realize this, but these are going from the smallest to the largest vehicle in the Falcon fleet, they're all using variations of the same engine. It was one engine with Falcon 1 and nine with Falcon 9 and so forth, and there was a Falcon 5 that was briefly considered as well. Uh, but you're not throwing things out unless you, in terms of development time, unless you actually need to, which they will when they go to a completely new technology with BFS. Um, going back to that agile methodology thing, humans have a tendency to think in Fibonacci sequences when it comes to estimating time. And so a Fibonacci is, you know, it's every number in this spiral is the sum of the two numbers before it. So 34 plus 21 is 55, you know, 21 is 13 plus eight, and so forth. And this is a spiral that occurs in nature. It's the way we tend to think. So what people with uh, agile methodologies realized is let's not fight this and put arbitrary dates that are at one month intervals or one week intervals on things. Let's work with that so that every estimate goes to the next number in the Fibonacci sequence and if you cannot do it in those 34 hours, then you're going to go to the 55 hour window. And instead of working against your psychology, you're working with it. So if that's the case, and if SpaceX is a agile company, we should see evidence of that. So I found this study of all the delays versus the announcements for the Falcon Heavy. And I thought, well, how does that compare to the Fibonacci sequence? So this is the Fibonacci sequence. It tends to average out around 62%. And this is those delays mapped out. So it's, it's almost a perfect match until the end when both of them get a little bit chaotic because then a one month delay, if it's a month out, is 50% as opposed to, or 100% delay. So it's, you know, it's gonna get noisy toward the end. That's launch date on that end and the earliest estimates on the other end. So if we apply that to the BFS, um, we've had one slight launch slip from the first estimate, which is, I'm, I, again, I apologize for the software. Um, the red dot is the announce date for the first, you know, the original announcement of the, of the ITR, the, the interplanetary transport. Um, the next dot is the second announcement the following year, and then the third dot is at South by Southwest, they gave a little bit of an update. So those color codes go to these estimates. Note they have not slipped the estimate for humans to Mars or cargo to Mars at all. Those are all locked in at their original settings and, and the LEO flight. They have slipped the hopper flight. Those bars go out as the initial estimate plus 63% and then averaged out to the next launch window for Mars. So that's why they all tend to stop at the same point. However, the longer they take to not slip those dates, um, the more that 63% is of a, of a smaller hole. So, the closer they get to this point without slipping it, the further back the other side of the scale goes. So if we follow this slope, we should theoretically see something getting to Mars in the, somewhere in the middle of that range if that graph continues at the, at the rate it's going. So when do we get to take a ride? Um, if the, the idea of the point-to-point -point transport on the uh, BFS as, as sort of a 45 minutes to anywhere in the world concept. 
Um, I think initially with those test flights, the green ones are gonna be at the launch facilities they have now at Texas and Florida. They may build something off Los Angeles because that's where the factory is. Uh, next iteration, we have two other spaceports. You know, we can use those as well. Plus, you know, uh, you know, Abu Dhabi and, and is one of those places where if there's anything futuristic, they want one. So I put a dot there. I also put one at Singapore. Um, and then I thought, well, there's, if those places have one, then who's the next generation who's going to demand their own spaceport? So it's New York and all these other uh, major cities around the world. And my, my criteria for that was, is it a major city? Can they afford it? And are they on a coastline where they could just jump on a ship and go out? And the thing I found interesting is I was looking all along northern Europe, and I was like, why aren't there any like, really major cities that are right on a coastline? Uh, like, I mean, biggest in the, and then I realized, well, if you were building those cities in the Viking era, building on the coastline would have been suicidal. The only major city like that is Copenhagen, which was Scandinavian. So they didn't have to worry about Vikings, they were Vikings. So, uh, so it, it, to this day, I guess if you're British and you know, you're wanting a spaceport outside, the Vikings are just as they were for your ancestors a thousand years ago, the reason you can't have nice things. So. So what about Blue Origin? Um, right now they are at 1,500 employees. Uh, SpaceX right now is at 6,000 employees. Um, Blue Origin plans to double that in the next two to three years, which will still get them at half of what SpaceX is now. Um, they are getting a billion dollars a year from uh, Jeff Bezos off of his Amazon fortunes, which at the rate he's going, he could continue that for roughly 125 years. Um, before he, has, he runs out of money, and that's assuming he doesn't reinvest it or make any more money. Um, so they're now saying that they're doing, finalizing some design issues, they're testing some key parts and so forth. So their motto is, you know, step by step ferociously, and they're doing a very slow iteration on that. That said, they do have uh, what I call second mover advantage. When you're the first on the market, then you're the one who defines the market, like the iPhone. But if you're the second mover on the market, you can figure out all the things that are weaknesses in your competitor and fill those niches. So you notice it's, there's like a huge gap between what the Falcon series can do and what the uh, big Falcon spaceship can do. They can fill that gap fairly easily. They already have a 50%, uh, you know, the first stage was reusable. It's going to be recovered on a ship and so forth. So they're, they're pretty far along, but they have, they've said very little about what goes above that. And they, this is also their first and what they say smallest um, orbital rocket. So this is New Glenn. New Armstrong is supposed to be even bigger. Well, their second mover advantage is why would they not then use the same composites to make a fully reusable larger vehicle? Um, so the strengths of New Space, uh, I think actually in some ways Blue Origin and SpaceX need each other because if you're a company or a government saying, I want to build a really big thing, but I don't want to risk you know, a $10 billion investment or whatever on something where there's, there may not be a rocket available because something goes wrong with SpaceX or whatever, the old adage is two is one, one is none. In other words, if there's two launch providers, you're much more likely to be able to rationalize building in the new space station or the new space telescope that's really huge. Um, we're talking about very large constellations of uh, satellites for very fast surface internet communication. You'd have an antenna about so big that you could have, you know, gigabit internet anywhere in the world. Um, that's not going to be much of a factor in major cities, but it could be a big deal if you buy your Tesla car and you can basically have, you know, gigabit speeds in your car for whatever reason. Um, with fifth generation internet, one idea is that the internet of things suddenly becomes very intelligent because you have very high speed, you can have very small, cheap sensor packages that have near real time communication with the outside world. Well, if you couple that with the satellite constellation, you can not only have that in cities, but you can have that anywhere in the world. Um, so that really opens up frontiers. There may be sensor constellations where they're talking about something like Google Earth, but in real time. So you could run a search with an artificial intelligence algorithm saying, show me all the traffic and all the Walmart parking lots in the country so that I can get an estimate of what their sales forecast is before they announce it at their stockholder meeting. 
So that's a valuable thing if you're a stock trader or if you're Walmart or if you're a competitor at Walmart. Um, so, and then this whole thing with Space Force, there's the idea that these high-speed missiles cannot be really tracked on conventional radar. So they're talking about, well, what if we have to put a massive constellation of satellites with radar on them for early warning that watches every missile and aircraft anywhere in the world in real time? Um, so there's all these constellations that could potentially be going up, as well as big telescopes like my other diagram and so forth. Uh, what are the threats to this? Well, that's all great for the first stages, but what do you do then? Um, that's great for low Earth orbit, but what about Mars? Uh, any company like this on this diffusion of innovations curve also has what's called the chasm or the valley of death or whatever, where you have to get past that point to become a, a mainstream thing. Um, you went from the big bricky cell phones, which were like that for a very long time before we started getting things we could put in our pockets. That's when the, the technology became democratized. So um, if there's nothing after that, or if it's all in low Earth orbit, is it going to get stagnant in low Earth orbit? These two asteroid mining companies start, are starting to peter out a little bit. I'm not sure how well funded they are at this point. Um, government contracts, you know, if they don't get out of doing things like SLS and the Lunar Gateway and start building, you know, you could take that same money and make four or five very large flagship missions. Uh, why pick from one of four flagship observatories, build all four, cancel the SLS? Um, that's the business NASA should be in. The question is, will they get there? And then if you've gone to any of my talks before, you've seen this diagram or some variation of it. We're finally breaking this edge of the challenges of space settlement with affordable large launch and mass fraction beyond Earth orbit. Beyond that, we're, having, we're not seeing a lot of activity, especially on some of these areas. And Elon Musk has pretty much said, well, we'll give you the railroad to go to Mars, but you have to do the stuff beyond the fuel and the basic habitat. You're, you know, they're depending on others to come up and step to the plate and build those companies. So who's building those companies? That, that may be a, a, a gap there. And that's one of the things I'm trying to work on with my, my little website here. Um, so any questions? Yes. How will the improvement propulsion system be that relative in terms of getting to Mars? Um, are you talking about? Uh, Lowering the timeline from six months. Well, a lot of those designs are controversial and they're not really critical. The thing that Musk is proposing is he can get there in three months just on chemical if he can refuel in orbit. Um, that in and of itself is controversial because you come in so hot when you get to Mars that it's hard to do aero capture then because you're, the faster you go, it tends to go up with the cube root of that in terms of the friction. So they have to make a ship that's not going to melt if it tries that. So it's, that's the tricky part, yeah. Yeah, the greater the mass. So it's like, it may be better to take a, a bigger cargo slower than to take a, you know, both from a safety standpoint and everything else than to try to get there faster. I, I, I suspect that for a while he'll be doing it at uh, six months instead of three months because there's, there's a number of advantages and that gives you the free return. Well, I think he's pushing it a bit, but the, the question then becomes... He, he knows that there's got to be a limit, and he doesn't know what it is yet. Yeah. So he's talked about taking the, one of the first things he wants to do once they test that it can hop from place to place is take the BFS flight straight up, turn around and burn the engine straight back down, and then try and slam into the atmosphere as hard as possible and see what it can take. Because they want it, that's, that's very critical as if, if the three-month versus six-month question. But he'll, he'll do that in the upper atmosphere. In the upper atmosphere of Earth, yeah. Right, it's, it's one of the first things he wants to try, so. Any other questions? Yes? Just when I'm a little concerned about cost control and the iterative process where you have a lot of very expensive uh, building and machinery to produce a complex device, whether it be a rocket or anything else, uh, how do you, like, in manufacturing airliners, for example, they do 
And then we've seen military protests in uh, right. Well, it, how, how do you propose to it? It's, uh, like I said, I don't work for SpaceX, so I can't get too deep into that. The, the issue is, and backing up your point a little bit, what we have in software is called regression testing, which is the more things, if you move too many components um, in one block, then you have too many variables when things go wrong. So what they're basically doing, it appears, is they're t if you move just one variable, it's much faster to diagnose advantages and disadvantages of that one variable. If you do 25, then you've got 25 things that could, e 25 factors which could all make a very complex equation to try and figure out what went wrong in that iteration. And, and if you're doing it with only one craft or two, mm -hmm. uh, it, that, that little increment doesn't cost you much. It can get you a lot. But if you're doing it with 500, then right. it's... The other, the other example of this actually is Apollo. Every Apollo vehicle was slightly different than the one that came before it because they kept in iterating the improvements. And so they went from you know, two guys being able to spend a few hours on the surface to having a rover and spending many hours, plus having a big camera on the outside of the um, service module of the um, orbiter that they would then go back and grab the film off of after doing photo surveys from orbit. So that was a much higher capacity on something that superficially looks identical. Any other questions? We've got one minute, maybe. Okay, thanks. <laughs>